It's a dark, rainy night in the fall of 1986. Hella Crafts steps into the car of a private investigator to learn the news she felt she knew all along. Her husband was indeed having an affair. Looking at the picture he placed into her hand, Hella, riddled with sadness, confirmed it was a picture of her husband in the arms of another love. Shortly after confirming the news, Hella Crafts completely disappeared. This episode is about how forensic science solved the puzzle of Hella Crafts' disappearance. Welcome to Crime Science. Hella had seen attorney Diane Anderson in the fall of 1986 regarding the possibility of divorce. She informed her of the fear of potential violence on the part of her husband, but still wanted to pursue the divorce. Hella, an unhappy wife and mother of three young children, still needed to confirm her suspicions that her husband Richard was indeed having an affair. After hiring a private investigator, her suspicions were confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt. Richard was seeing another woman. Investigator Keith Mayo was able to capture photos of Richard Crafts and his lover together often, showing affection or kissing. After 12 years of marriage, Hella came to realize now that it was over. She broke down and cried from the grief and sobbed helplessly for 10 minutes. Hella and Richard both worked for airlines. Hella was a flight attendant for Pan Am, Richard was a pilot for Eastern Airlines, and a part-time police officer. Richard was the kind of man that could be described as cold and uncaring, who had a deep, dark, cold stare. Needless to say, their relationship was far from a close one. Friends of the couple say that Richard sometimes hit Hella. In a letter sent to her mother, Hella said she no longer trusted Richard and told him that she wanted a divorce. Soon after filing for her divorce, Hella had the courage to confide in her co-workers and told them the same thing she had once told her lawyer, that if something bad were to happen to her, not to believe for one second that it was an accident. In her lawyer's own words, that is an unusual statement to hear from a client. On the evening of November 18, 1986, Hella returned home from a European flight assignment and was dropped off at home by her best friend. It was the last time anyone would see her again. After a few days when Hella missed her next flight assignment and didn't call in, friends called the Crafts home. Richard said that she went to Denmark to visit her sick mother, but later told a different story that she was on vacation with a friend. Both statements later proved to be lies. After people began talking and sharing information they had about Hella, panic began to set in. Friends were calling Hella's lawyer, saying Hella had disappeared, something she definitely wouldn't have done on her own will, having three children whom she loved dearly. Lawyer Diane Anderson then put a call into Keith Mayo, the investigator who was assigned to prove Richard was cheating. Mayo insisted that they should go to the police and report her missing. Sadly, local police turned a deaf ear on the pair. Richard Mayo took it upon himself to do his own investigating. After some digging, Mayo spoke with the craft's nanny, who stated that she had noticed some dark staining on the carpet shortly after Hella had disappeared. The nanny stated that behind the bedroom door, there was a big black spot on the floor, about six to eight inches in diameter. The carpet in the bedroom was fairly new, and so was the stain. Richard had the carpet torn up and wouldn't explain to the nanny why. Also, a large freezer from the garage had gone suspiciously missing. Credit card receipts showed that Richard had rented a commercial wood chipper right after Hella disappeared. Did something happen inside the house to Hella? Was her husband involved? After this information was passed on to state police, 
they had Richard come in for a lie detector test. However, the polygraph examiner stated that neither he nor his partner saw any indication that he was lying. With Helicraft still missing and no further leads to investigate, the Connecticut State Police brought in their secret weapon, Dr. Henry Lee. Dr. Henry Lee was, at the time, the director of the Connecticut State Police Forensic Laboratory. He was also known as one of the world's most respected forensic experts. Dr. Lee accompanied police to the Kraft's home to conduct further forensic testing. Dr. Lee began by examining the mattress and found some tiny clues. Clues so small they could hardly be seen by eye. Could these clues hold key information into the disappearance of Hella Crafts? The clues, five minute droplets of blood were found to be of human origin after orthotolidine tests turned blue. Further antigen testing matched them as type O, the same type as Hella. Further testing revealed it to be circulatory blood and not menstrual. That means that some type of injury was caused. To create this pattern of droplets, Dr. Lee concluded that these blood droplets landed at an angle of precisely 10 degrees, indicating that someone had been leaning over the bed or kneeling. The blood moved through the air at a medium velocity, consistent with blunt force trauma and injury. Further investigation found a 6-inch blood smear on the side of the mattress. The bathroom towels had been recently washed. However, orthotolidine tests also proved that the towels had once been soaked with blood. But there has to be a body. A body just doesn't disappear into thin air. But there was no body, no weapon, and not a single witness. Police had to find something more to go on. So they looked into any unusual incidents that may have happened that could possibly be connected to Hella's sudden disappearance. A snowplow driver might have had the break that police needed. He reported seeing a wood chipper on a bridge at about 3.30 in the morning. He also spotted a man wearing an orange poncho. Homicide investigators had the driver bring them to the exact location where he had seen the man and the chipper. Right where the Housatanic River runs into Lake Zor, Police found a few piles of wood chips, but not much else. But after a closer second look, they found a piece of mail addressed to Mrs. Hella L. Crafts. It was at that particular time, after sifting through the chips, human hair was found among them. Further investigation found some blue fibers, a gray piece of metal, and what looked like tiny bone fragments. Later, a piece of painted fingernail was found on top of some leaves. Divers then combed the river bottom and discovered pieces of a chainsaw with the serial number scratched off. All of this was taken to the forensic lab in Meriden, Connecticut. The case had now become a worldwide spectacle, hitting newspapers and nightly news programs the world over. Richard Crafts was the lead suspect, yet he maintained his innocence. He said he didn't kill his wife, didn't know her whereabouts, and that he had passed a lie detector test. Forensics, however, might have something to say about that. They had the painstaking task of putting together every piece that was found, every fragment, and every hair and blood droplet. The chief medical examiner, H. Wayne Carver II, needed either a body and a certificate of death or an insurmountable pile of evidence proving that someone is dead. The challenge came down to Dr. Lee and his team of scientists at the lab. They began to examine every notch of that chainsaw, and in it found a piece of human hair tissue and the smallest piece of fiber. Right on the very edge of the cutting surface was a piece of bluish-green cotton the very same color as Hella's favorite nightshirt. It matched other fibers found at the site. The problem was the serial number on the chainsaw was gone. It could have belonged to just about anyone. It was impossible to know, or was it? 
By using a specific chemical, scientists believed that they could melt away the upper layers of metal that were damaged by the water or by physical means to alter the number. And it worked. There was the number. 592161. It matched the manufacturer's warranty card sent in by none other than Richard B. Crafts. Now, forensic specialists had to identify the hair found in the chainsaw and along the riverside. Each and every hair found was scrupulously examined. They had been cut, but not by scissors. Did those hairs found belong to Hella? After some hair was taken from a hairbrush that belonged to Hella, and some of the hair samples from the riverbanks were compared, it was determined that the samples were microscopically similar. A telltale sign was an unusual ridge in the hair samples, which matched almost perfectly. The focus was then put on the fingernail with red nail polish that was found at the site. The polish matched polish found on Hella's bedside table. But even with all of this, it only proved that it came from Hella Crafts. What it didn't prove was if she was alive or dead. Dr. Lee then turned to Albert Harper, a biological anthropologist for assistance, to look at the bone fragments. He wanted to see if Harper could identify them in any way. Since Lee had believed that Richard had put Hella's body through a chipper, he performed an experiment. Dr. Lee got the same model of chipper and ran a pig body through it, since pig and human bone and flesh are very similar. Dr. Lee noted that the chipper had made a signature style cut pattern. This cut pattern matched the exact style as the cutter used to cut the debris found at the river site. Under a microscope, Dr. Harper was able to determine that the bone fragments, which were just a millimeter in size, did in fact come from a human. When placed under a spectrograph, Dr. Harper noticed that tiny grooves found in the bones told a story, that they were formed by blood vessels found in the top of the skull, something only humans have. They also identified fragments from the side of the skull. Experts now understood they couldn't determine if Hella was dead before going into the chipper, but knew she certainly was after. Dr. Harper then froze some of the samples in liquid nitrogen and ground them into a fine powder, and tests showed the samples were from someone with type O blood, Hella Kraft's blood type. Dr. Lee now looked into the gray metal fragment found at the site, which was believed to be from a tooth crown. However, there were no human remains left on the crown, so it wasn't good evidence. Dr. Lee asked a colleague to go back to the riverside to do some more sifting and digging. After five days of turning up nothing, everything seemed hopeless. But by a stroke of clumsy luck, the investigator slipped and fell into the water. His hand was covered in muck and debris. The investigator cleaned off his hand in a bucket of water that was being used for evidence collection. After looking down into the pail, what was found? None other than a tooth. But was it Hella's? After searching through years' worth of dental records, it was in fact determined that the tooth did come from Hella Crafts. The team had their match. It also showed that she had in fact gone through the chipper, and the tooth was knocked violently from her body, which means Hella Crafts is indeed dead. Based on the entirety of the evidence found, Richard Crafts is picked up and charged with the murder of his wife. Investigators were now able to put together a reasonable timeline scenario of what happened that night on November 18, 1986. Hella returned from her European flight and got home around 7 p.m. She gave the nanny the night off, put the kids to bed, and slipped into her favorite blue nightshirt. She then looked through her mail and then confronted Richard. It happened quickly. He used a police flashlight to deliver the first blow, knocking her to the ground. 
then a second time, which produced the blood spatter that hit the mattress at a 10 degree angle. As she was falling to the ground, her head slid across the mattress, leaving a blood smear. Then he wrapped the body in the bed sheets and blankets and carried her body to the freezer in the garage and dumped her in it. After that, he tried to clean everything up using the towels and then wash them. However, traces still remained. Later evidence that was discovered is the nanny returned home at 2 a.m. and went straight to bed. Barely by daybreak, Richard Crafts gathered the children and the nanny and took them to his sisters, telling them that Hella had left him. He then hurriedly rented a wood chipper and a U-Haul truck and transported the remains, a chainsaw and some wood, to the river. That's where the plow driver had noticed the chipper, first at the bridge at around 3.30 in the morning, and then again near the river about an hour later. Crafts took the chainsaw and used it to dismember Hella's frozen remains and put them through the chipper, which produced very little splatter. Most everything went into the river, with only a few things landing on shore. The mail Hella had in her nightshirt pocket went through virtually unscathed. Then, Crafts took apart the chainsaw and scratched off the serial number and tossed it into the river as well. Richard Crafts almost got away with the perfect crime. He truly believed he could and would never get caught. He felt so sure of himself, he passed a lie detector test. If it hadn't been for a well-assembled forensic team and minuscule pieces of evidence left behind, he might have gotten away with murder. Instead, after a hung jury and a second trial, Richard Crafts was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 50 years in prison. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like this episode and share it with your friends. We'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to our channel if you haven't already, and hit the bell icon to get notified of our next posting. I'll see you in the next one.